start with uh, this. Uh, dynamics on surfaces is uh, something that I found looking and preparing for this talk. Back in 1984, there was a series of symposia in, uh, called the Jerusalem Symposiums on uh, this on quantum chemistry and biochemistry. In volume 17, uh, Lewis, uh, you participated here and contributed this talk on quantum size effects and the electronic properties of small semiconductor crystallites. And I think it was an early sign for Israel in general, uh, where we have a great focus on nanoscience today. And in the audience, we have some colleagues here also from Israel. And um, you know, at that time, 30 years ago, uh, this is where I was, on the bridge of an Israeli Navy patrol boat. Louis, I know that you were also in the American Navy at different times. And well, you know, when I saw this, uh, I, I asked, uh, did you hear about those recent reports on quantum confined small crystallites? Over. Uh, not quite so. It took a few years for me to enter the field into the university. I started also with uh, femtosecond spectroscopy. I also thought it was too hard, so I shifted to nano. No, just kidding. It was, nano is also very, very challenging at the time. And this is uh, 10 years later, uh, starting the postdoc, and that's when, at this period, where I uh, became acquainted uh, also with Sasha. Where is Sasha now? There you are, yes, during my postdoc. Um, and uh, this is a work that I'll talk about a little bit uh, from those uh, days on uh, 3.5 uh, nanocrystal quantum dots looking at uh, electronic level structure. I have a picture here with my son who's now 21 years old, but for a good reason because I think this is really, there's a family feeling here, you know, we heard the, the, the fathers, we've, we've heard some of the sons, uh, we have grandsons, we have uh, grand-grandsons in here, so really this is a family, I think this is something which is really uh, great for this quantum dot community of ours. So, um, you know, uh, another thing that I would like to uh, thank you, Louis, is for your part in actually supporting the Israel National Nanotechnology Initiative, uh, among others. President Peres is also a champion of, uh, of nanotechnology for Israel. And uh, Louis has served on the International Nanotechnology Advisory Board of this uh, program, really assisting us in guiding uh, where nanoscience in Israel can go. So um, I'll, I'll start with the history a little bit uh, to highlight aspects of artificial atom character, characteristics which we've worked on over the years of these uh, quantum dots, and also the area of hybrid semiconductor metal nanoparticles to try to link to uh, where I was particularly inspired by, by you, Louis and F. Sasha, and so on. And then uh, the second part will be on dimensionality effects related to polarized emission from nanorods, a very recent work on a new structure called we call nanorod couples, and uh, finishing off with uh, dimensionality effects in energy transfer processes between nanocrystals and dye molecules on their surfaces. So you know, um, it, when in, in the quantum confinement uh, aspect, what we uh, did uh, in the when I came back to Jerusalem, I met up with uh, Professor Oded Milo. And together, uh, we decided to combine optical and tunneling spectroscopies to this uh, quantum dot problem. Um, and uh, it was quite a, a, a useful endeavor because these are really complementary methods, uh, considering that optical spectroscopies are sensitive to transitions which are governed by selection rules between valence band and conduction band states. And when you use tunneling, you can probe either the valence or conduction band states individually and separately and without selection rules, basically. Here you also have single electron charging effects where there is no charging in the optical case. And uh, this opportunity also allows for the um, uh, uh, potential to, to actually extract also symmetry of states based on their uh, degeneracy or charging properties. So indeed, one of the first works uh, that I was involved in and that we started off in Jerusalem, or this was al already from my postdoc with Paul, um, starting with the optical part, using the size-selected spectroscopy for indium arsenide, which was first of all a synthesis of a 3.5, which still remains a challenge in this field to actually go into the 3.5 more covalent type of uh, systems in, in nanocrystals. Uh, but uh, really we could identify, as you see here, up to nine states. And uh, that's when I met Sasha uh, to try to figure out more than just these very careful experiments of mapping out all these levels how to actually interpret this data. And um, I learned a lot from you, Sasha, so thank you about this uh, opportunity to use an eight-band 
approach, effective mass-based approach, coupling both the conduction band and valence band states together, and actually uh, could actually achieve a very nice assignment of the different optical transitions in this, what looks like a kind of a quite complicated level structure of indium arsenide quantum dot. So uh, this was uh, quite a, a, uh, a nice entry for me to really uh, learn about spectroscopy of uh, quantum dots. So we complemented this with uh, STM, looking at single particles, forming a double barrier tunnel junction. You can link the particles to a conducting substrate. You can obtain an image of a single dot, uh, and then at low temperature carry out the spectroscopy, which is really quite beautiful. Um, it, has, it shows, the IV curve shows the band gap, uh, positive bias side with steps corresponding to tunneling through conduction band states. Every time you enter a new state or charge, a, or charge the state with an additional electron, you increase the current. And the same applies to the negative bias side for the valence band states. And here, really, you have kind of the artificial atom type uh, symmetry uh, emerging uh, in the DIDV curve proportional to the tunneling density of states. The doublet here is the S-like state in the conduction band. And then there is a higher uh, separation followed by the higher order multiplet of the P-like state in the conduction bands. Uh, the valence band is always more complicated, as we know. But still, uh, here we could also identify two groups of, uh, of uh, charging peaks attributed to two valence band states. So you really can extract a lot of uh, spectroscopic information um, in, in terms of uh, energies of gaps, uh, charging energies, S to P sta state separations, uh, as well as valence band level separations. And uh, indeed, um, this um, data uh, showing the size dependence really shows a lot of the quantum confinement effects predicted 15 years earlier than this paper by uh, the founders of the field here. Uh, the conduction, the, the, the band gap increasing as we go to smaller size. The uh, S2P separation also increasing. Charging energies increasing when we go to lower size. And also in the valence band, we could always identify two groups of peaks and uh, uh, could kind of map out the separation between these two groups of peaks. So really, it was quite satisfying to, to uh, follow up on this artificial atom analogy uh, with quantum dots. And maybe it's a nice uh, continuation to Chris's talk where, um, uh, who took this uh, artificial atom into actually constructing supercrystals of nanocrystals. Now, um, you can combine these two together, and that's also very powerful, in order to assist in actually proving level assignment between optical transitions, which are actually transitions between conduction and valence band states. And uh, this kind of assignment, I won't go through all, this, uh, all these different uh, considerations, but uh, this kind of assignment really allowed us, for example, to identify the 2S3 half 1SE transition, also to identify the 1S3 F1 PE transition, namely that we have quite um, uh, strong evidence for SP mixing at the valence band edge of these kind of nanocrystals. And um, we followed up on this uh, with uh, further work over the years. The next uh, uh, important uh, observation that we had was, was uh, using uh, core shell structures to actually image the wave functions, really, the atomic wave functions using, using the STM. The choice of indium arsenide uh, with a zinc selenide core shell architecture was actually uh, quite good for this. Uh, first, indium arsenide itself has the narrow gap, which is important for the tunneling experiments because you cannot go to too high a bias in these measurements. And also, this particular band offset between the, uh, in the conduction band for the zinc selenide shell is one in which you can distinguish between the S state, which is well localized inside, and the P state that is now spilling out uh, of the well, okay? So the extent of these wave functions actually is quite different. And uh, also, uh, that allowed us to actually use current imaging tunneling spectroscopy to, first of all, observe just uh, S-like states here, which is smaller than the higher states when you actually measure the uh, current image at uh, 1.4 volts here into the P-state or at 1.9 volts. Even beyond that, we were able to identify a uh, kind of flat top bagel shape in the middle of the P-like uh, multiplet, which really corresponds nicely to a combination of the in-plane components of the P-wave functions. While when you go to 1.9 volts, you already regain back the spherical combination 
of the PZ and PXPY uh, squared uh, components of the P wave functions. So this is really uh, allowing us, this allowed us to actually image the uh, atomic-like states uh, of these kind of uh, spherical quantum dots. We continued with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Milo with Oded to, to use the STM also on nanorods to image wave functions to measure band offsets and also in our doping work uh, to this day. Now, um, moving on, um, 10 years after 94 to 2004, uh, we also um, decided to try to expand the family of uh, just semiconductor nanoparticles and add another component to the problem, uh, in combining actually metals with semiconductors as a concept of hybrid uh, systems. And I was very fortunate to have Talib Mukarius here in the audience to have as a very talented student leading this effort in my group and pioneering this effort. And uh, what, what you see here is the nano dumbbell in which the um, highly reactive facets of the uh, edges of the nanorod um, preferentially lead to growth of uh, gold just on those tips. We had in mind using this as a connecting, uh, as tips for connections, for electrical connections and for self-assembly. Some of that was actually realized quite nicely already. And in fact, um, this also opened up quite a, a vast uh, opportunity for this bottom-up approach, which I think is a very important component of, uh, of uh, the colloidal nanocrystal approach, of course, which means that we can really have access to materials that uh, you cannot access in other ways. And uh, the selection and plethora, a plethora of materials has been developed by various groups combining different uh, metallic, magnetic, and semiconducting systems together with different growth modes and different characteristics. There are, there, there are two reviews where you can actually read about these uh, developments um, uh, on the hybrid uh, metal semiconductor nanoparticles. Now, um, in this part, um, one of the things that we worked on with Talib and what we saw was that we could achieve also, instead of two-sided growth of gold on cad selenide, in some cases, in some conditions, also one-sided growth. We saw that in quantum dots and longer rods and so on. And this was quite intriguing, what is going on here. Um, we found uh, in this study that uh, this was dependent on the concentration of gold per nanocrystal. At relatively lower concentrations, two-sided growth was uh, observed. And when we increased the concentration, we actually saw a transition to, uh, from two to one-sided uh, gold-tipped system. Um, we uh, figured out that this is a ripening effect in collaboration with uh, Professor Iran Rabani from Tel Aviv University, who uh, devised a two-dimensional simulation of this kind of effect. Basically, initially, uh, gold will deposit on these reactive sites, but then uh, at some point, uh, one of them, one of these islands becomes dominant and more stable, and you have a kind of a, a ripening effect, an Oswald ripening effect, driving uh, the growth on one side, preferentially on account of the other side, which actually dissolves. And this is where, again, uh, I was inspired by, uh, by you, Lewis. This is a paper, your name here is uh, cut, I'm sorry. This is a paper from uh, um, 2005 where uh, Lewis looked at with his uh, co-workers on silver films on conducting substrates. And with time, they, they saw what they observed was this ripening effect, gross ripening effect of the silver uh, into uh, very small, very big islands uh, forming here. And uh, what, what was required here is a conducting substrate. A conducting substrate was required because unlike just regular Electro, uh, Oswald ripening, this is an electrochemical Oswald ripening effect where electrons are actually uh, involved in uh, traversing from the small particle to the big particle and then the, the, the small particle will oxidize with silver to the solution and this, the, the, the big particle will, will grow as you would expect. Uh, it's driven by the size dependent uh, reduction potential of the silver particles. And this, this is what we see also in our nanoparticles, we see also an electrochemical Oswald ripening effect where the charge is actually transferred, what we imagine, across the semiconductor rod in this case, um, leading for, to a dissolution of the small particle and growth of the bigger particle because of this Oswald ripening effect with the electrochemical component. And perhaps the best proof for that at the time was uh, this experiment 
uh, where, um, uh, which carried out by Taleb, which at very uh, early times could actually take an aliquot uh, of a sample which had a large concentration, and you still see this two-sided growth. And after three minutes already, this stabilized into a very clear one-sided grown system, which remained stable in solution for eight hours. Namely, we needed the nanorod itself in order to mediate this ripening effect. And there was no ripening observed over many hours between different nanorods. And this establishes this mechanism and uh, another piece of uh, kind of um, inspiration that uh, we had from the work of Lewis. Now, um, um, nowadays, these hybrid metal semiconductor nanoparticle uh, are continuing uh, in their study in my group. Uh, we've extended this into other systems, for example, uh, lead sulfide or lead oxide, with an interest particularly in photocatalysis. And uh, Jochen will give a talk, I think, about photocatalysis later in the conference as well. So this is definitely one of the interesting areas of this ability to combine semiconductor and metal particles together. Uh, utilizing them for transferring light energy into chemical energy. Uh, and the, the cage structures are also an interesting architecture for catalysis or photocatalysis, so different growth mode where we have edge growth on, the, on these uh, well-defined edges of the crystallite. And actually, this uh, uh, kind of work has also led us into doping, uh, using uh, metal ions or metal uh, atoms to dope uh, indium arsenide as a model system uh, by kind of a reaction that was inspired from these early reactions of uh, reacting metal precursors with uh, the semiconductor particles. And I, I believe that David Norris will, will cover doping in, in a later talk in the conference. Um, and uh, um, this really opens up the path for different applications with these hybrid systems, uh, again, in photocatalysis and as contact points in both uh, electrical connections as well as self-assembly. So um, this now leads me to the second part, which uh, relates to dimensionality effects. And I'm going to focus on nanorods. Nanorods uh, that were pioneered um, uh, back in 2000 with the work of uh, Paul Levisados and Zhao Gang Peng and Liberato Mana in Berkeley. And we soon uh, picked up this idea to actually look at shape control. They're fascinating systems, uh, both of, uh, for fundamental reasons, because we can really use them as uh, building lock uh, to, to investigate the transition between, between 0D quantum dots, the artificial atoms, and 1D nanowires. And, um, and uh, these kind of uh, systems, first of all, manifest polarized emission, which I will talk about. I will, I will say something about polarization in these systems. Um, polarized emission is also something very important for displays, for flat panel displays. Uh, we, we do have a spin-off company in Jerusalem which is developing specifically nanorods for display applications with, uh, the, with uh, using the uh, polarization properties and other characteristics of nanorods for this feature, for this, for this uh, aspect. Um, early on, uh, th there was also a study that we did on lasing with nanorods, which turned out to provide improved properties for lasing. Uh, this work was led by Miri Kazes, who is also in the audience here. And, uh, um, um, that's another attribute of, of uh, nanorod architectures providing improved lasing characteristics because of reduced OJ increased, uh, and increased um, oscillator strength. Um, with nanorods, you can actually try to really contact single objects, single nanocrystals with uh, very small electrode gaps and put them in between electrode gaps. It's still an heroic uh, effort to do that, but you could do that. That was demonstrated in several papers here. With nanorods, you also have interesting uh, opportunities for photovoltaic properties based on the ability to actually achieve some band bending, if you like, across the nanorod system, unlike a small quantum dot, which is too small for such an effect. Uh, we also have interesting assembly effects with nanorods because of this uh, unique anisotropic axis of the system. And uh, today, I will also touch upon energy transfer effects, where we look at dimensionality uh, of the system where the nanocrystals serve as donor, and we have the opportunity to change both the, the donor uh, region as well as the distribution of dye acceptors on the surface from a sphere to a rod uh, geometry. So um, starting with uh, polarization, um, what, what you can do first is use really uh, quite uh, established um, ensemble approaches from dye molecules and so on in spectroscopy using anisotropy. 
So this is a very uh, straightforward way to get a lot of information on the polarization properties of nonneurons. Here you see a chart using those kind of approaches where you have polarized emission in a solution just to uh, photo select a subset of the uh, absorbing nonneurons, sorry, and uh, then uh, um, analyze uh, the, the anisotropy by measuring two perpendicular polarizations. And you can see very nicely uh, and a two classes here. Uh, sphere in rod, this is a very short rod in rod. We also have the ability to make a rod overcoated with a rod. And uh, these uh, anisotropies on the order of 0.2, while when we went to longer rods, longer rods inside especially, longer rod in rod inside, there's a jump here up to 0.3 related to the rod geometry. So uh, we could really achieve higher polarization uh, anisotropy by uh, controlling the architecture and the dimensionality of this interior rod in this seeded rod uh, systems, which have very nice uh, emission properties, actually, uh, with very bright fluorescence, paralleling that of uh, what, what is achieved in core shells, or nearly paralleling that in what is achieved in spherical core shells. Now, um, these uh, ensemble studies can be complemented by single particle uh, um, measurements. And uh, this kind of technique is uh, commonly used also in our group, where we can simultaneously image the polarization of both, uh, of both uh, perpendicular and vertical orientations for single nanorods on two regions of the camera. This is an example where this nanorod is actually uh, showing a, a, a well-defined polarization value, which we can extract. And now what we further can do here in our setup is that we have a combination of a photoluminescence a microluminescence microscope together with an AFM on top. And this is the photoluminescence image. Let's focus on these four uh, spots of luminescence. Uh, and on the same region, we can take now an AFM image of the same region, showing some particles here, some nanorods. Uh, this is an overlay, a direct overlay of the fluorescent spots of the photoluminescence with the AFM. And then we can uh, focus and zoom in, for example, to this nanorod, take a high resolution image, and actually look that we have only one nanorod, look and determine the exact orientation of this nanorod and correlate that to the fluorescence polarization. This is, the, this is for one, this is for another one, as you see here. And uh, doing that, we were able to show directly that uh, the polarization is indeed uh, correlated well to the long axis of the nanorod. Uh, for these three uh, exemplary particles, you, it's shown here in this image. It's not surprising. We, we might have predicted that, of course, but it's satisfying to see that. And the ability to actually correlate AFM and photoluminescence together gives you a lot of uh, assurances that you're looking at single particles and gives you further information beyond just the optical data from a single particle uh, analysis. Now, what did I do? Okay. Now, um, this allowed us, uh, this kind of study allowed us to actually take the single particle distribution of polarizations and actually go back to comparing that to ensemble. So here you see distribution of polarizations for the sphere in rod system versus rod in rod system over hundreds of particles measured with this uh, single particle polarization approach compared to the ensemble data. The average is nearly the same. So this validates both, I would say, the ensemble approach, this photo selection approach to use it for determining eventually emission polarizations um, for uh, nanorods. And it's a much more flexible way to do that compared to single particles, which are still more difficult to do. And uh, also, another point is that you see consistently the larger anisotropy, the larger polarization uh, characteristic of the nanorod in rod architecture compared to the sphere in rod as uh, seen here. Uh, and uh, actually, what is the origin of, these, uh, of this behavior? So um, what we see here in this graph is a summary of the dependence of the emission polarization on core aspect ratio. So the core is the one that's really important here, assuming that the shell is also already rod shaped. And you see that uh, only in, in very low aspect ratios, the value is on the order of a little less or around 0.7. There is a jump here to uh, about 0.8 or higher when we uh, achieve a, some uh, aspect ratio of about 4 and higher for the inner rod. 
Actually, this is a combination of electronic and dielectric effects. Uh, the electronic effect first is the fact that uh, if we look at the uh, valence band atomic orbitals, which are the ones who determine the polarizations uh, of the cadmium selenide seed, uh, you see that the PXY orbitals are slightly higher than the PZ orbitals, and that has led to um, in-plane polarization component for spherical nanocrystals, as was demonstrated by Munji in the early, uh, in the early work on single particle uh, emission polarization in spherical particles. But uh, uh, the PZ component is very close by, so at room temperature, this is washed out, and, and the sphere will not provide you with a significant polarization. However, in a nanorod case, this flips, and the uh, Z orbitals, the Z or atomic orbitals become higher, and this leads to a polarization, which is along the C-axis of the uh, elongated nanorod. Now, a seed and a rod structure is somewhere in between. It's not fully developed uh, separation into PZ, but quite nicely developed, and therefore you do have polarization induced probably by strain effect here, and maybe possibly some preferential alloying along the elongated axis of the nanorod to provide linear polarization. And the rod and rod architecture actually lies completely on this side, and that's why we see an increased polarization in the rod and rod system compared to the sphere and rod. Uh, concerning the absorption, uh, which is also polarized in these nanorod systems, this is related to uh, classical dielectric contribution when we go to higher states. So when you go to higher uh, levels, uh, over there we have uh, quite a dense distribution of states in general, and there's also a classical dielectric contribution uh, in which the uh, field component, the electro electromagnetic field component, uh, perpendicular to the rod is attenuated significantly, while the one which is parallel to the rod is actually maintained. And therefore, you also have contribution to polarization and absorption related to this dielectric effect. So uh, this is the polarization effect. And then, uh, in our quest to actually look at other systems and control their shapes, we've uh, been working on zinc selenide. And in zinc selenide, you see that what we did in this synthesis, which I will not detail uh, very much about, but I want to, sh to show you, you see these very peculiar shapes. It looks like two rods coming together. We call this uh, nanorod couples. This was recently published in, in, in Nature Materials, just recently. And if we zoom in here, uh, you see uh, a, a, a zoom in of these uh, couples. They're, they're actually linked at the edges with this uh, growing region over here. Um, and also the uh, high-resolution SEM very clearly shows two nanorods, which are actually can, they can actually twist. That's why uh, you see some twisting here also. This, that's why this one is looking like perhaps one rod, but it, it might be just a, a couple sitting on, on its edge. Now, uh, this, is, this system actually grows quite interestingly with a mechanism that we termed as self-limited self-assembly. It starts off with uh, an oriented attachment process providing zinc selenide nanowires, which is well known in solution that you can get nanowires with oriented attachment. But in a second phase of the reaction, when we heat it up uh, to a second phase, actually the, the nanowires shorten via ripening effect, and furthermore, they come together, and because of the higher reactivity of the end facets, tend to grow this twin uh, end facet combination or connection, which actually then terminates the growth and this is the, the origin of this self-limiting process. So they come together for a short time, the, the edges grow, and then this uh, kind of growth ceases. So here we have two rods together. This is an interesting system to look at. Uh, we've changed the dimensionality again somehow. And indeed, if you use a, a finite well-effective mass approximation to calculate what you predict for this system, we actually see that uh, compared to nanorod, uh, uh, single nanorods, in the coupled case, the single nanorods show a state which is elongated and polarized along the long axis. Here, you see that the lowest states are actually edge, short edge states, or short, these states that are localized here. They come in couples, uh, anti-symmetric and symmetric states in, in both uh, the valence band and the conduction band uh, levels. And, uh, the way that uh, we chose to actually uh, prove this uh, change in dimensionality was to look at polarization effects because, of course, we have a distribution of sizes, so it's not easy just to measure energetics here. By the way, the lowering of the band gap is related to the fact that this end, fast end region is actually thicker because of the twinning effect. 
Um, so now uh, what we do is use, utilize, we've changed the symmetry of the system, and we can again utilize this uh, single particle polarization approach. And indeed, what we saw was this is a typical measurement for a single rod. This is a typical measurement for a rod couple. The average, uh, um, mean pol the average polarization is much lower in rod couples, about 0.2 compared to 0.5 in nanorods, which is in, in consistency with this uh, picture that we have of changing the states from an elongated state to edge states. Now, using a process of cation exchange on these kind of systems, we were able to also make lead sulfide instead, or lead selenide instead of zinc selenide. And I'm mentioning that because really the next thing that we would like to do is to try to look at coupling effects between two nanorods which are proximal to each other with a well-defined uh, distance of about two nanometers dictated by the oleolamine ligands on the surface here. And that would allow us to actually look at, uh, hopefully, some coupling effects because lead selenide has this very large bore radius so uh, we're hoping to do that, and, and we're working on that for, for the next step. OK, um, um, the, the, the last part of the talk will be devoted to energy transfer and dimensionality effects in energy transfer. Uh, so really, we, the, this, the CAD selenide, CAD sulfide system that I've just described uh, offers us uh, a very nice uh, test bed of uh, what are dimensionality effects in energy transfer. We can change the inner core, which is the donor. We can change the outer surface from a sphere to a rod to change the distribution of the acceptors bound to the surface. And why would we do that? So everybody knows about Forrester energy transfer, which is what we're using here. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, for nanocrystals, this is a, a very interesting opportunity because uh, they're excellent donors, really. And therefore, they can serve as a, a kind of a ruler. The energy transfer can, can be a good ruler to obtain distances between two chromophores. They can provide evidence for binding, and this is useful for sensing applications. For example, this is older work with Professor Vilner at the Hebrew University, in which we looked at um, two DNA strands, one linked to the nanocrystal itself serving as a donor, and the, acceptor, uh, the other one linked to an acceptor, Texas Red. And when they hybridize, this is when you start to see FRET coming. And you can dehybridize this and see the FRET going away. So it's actually nice and interesting for hybridization, sensing, and so on. And uh, also, uh, Dan Oron, who's also in the audience, uh, in particular demonstrated the use of energy transfer uh, uh, between different species also for photovoltaic applications. So this is uh, part of the motivation to look at this. So um, to do that, we can take these different systems, bind dye molecules on the surface at different ratios, and you see clearly the donor emission coming down in all of these systems, acceptor emission coming up, which is a hallmark of energy transfer. We can look at the energy transfer efficiency now. This uh, kind of by looking at the donor acceptor intensity over the donor intensity. And when you look at it just uh, uh, over uh, com compared to the dye molecules added per nanoparticle, it's not very obvious um, uh, to, to look at this. Um, but in general, um, in longer nanorods, we need more nanocrystals, uh, more dye molecules to be added in order to get sufficient density of acceptors near the uh, donor seed here. Um, and this is much more clearly um, uh, analyzed if we normalize this axis to the actual uh, density of attached dye molecules, surface density. And then uh, most of these fall quite close on, on the same, on the same uh, curve. Uh, all these spherical uh, core shell or seeded rod systems fall more or less on the same curve uh, because what is determining the efficiency is mostly the dye molecules, the density of dye molecules near the donor center. In the rod and rod, we see a um, a much uh, higher efficiency for similar surface concentrations, which also is consistent with the fact that the donor region now is extended to a longer region along the nanorod. And this is a first dimensionality effect that you can observe in, 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 in relation to the donor shape. Um, time resolved measurements actually offer an, an, a very interesting view on uh, dimensionality effects. What, we, what you see here is the ability also beyond intensities to probe lifetimes, which are provide the donor lifetime provides a lot of information. Uh, as you increase the uh, acceptor density, you obviously shorten the donor lifetime. And uh, this allows us to look at temporal decay uh, in 1D, 2D, or 3D systems. This was already done by Forrester for infinite systems. And uh, what Forrester already showed for infinite acceptor distributions in 1D, 2D or 3D is that the dimensionality is directly affecting the decay, be it 1 over 6 for one-dimensional systems, 
2 over 6, 1 third for uh, 2D, or a half for 3D distribution. In our case, we have a finite uh, distribution of acceptors. I will skip this theoretical contribution or consideration. Just to say that our um, energy transfer uh, is now going to be also analyzed by the lifetimes, but actually what you see here is a time-dependent Fred dimensionality. And when you look at uh, energy transfer in a spherical particle, you really see this uh, dimensionality effect borne out in this early times, only the excluded volume where we don't have acceptors is more or less dominant. In this later times, we are already reaching the finite distance of acceptors located on the surface, and this flattens out to the zero-dimensional limit, and uh, the concentrations actually scale the decay. In the 1D case, um, the, you see that uh, there is a scaling here of the at short times where the excluded volume is dominant again, and at long times, you see that we are actually approaching this 1D limit and not the 0D limit because of the actual distribution of the more far away acceptors. So this is a very nice dimensionality effect in our uh, nanocrystals. Um, this is uh, summarized in this image, in this figure, the difference between a spherical system, a spherical distribution, or an elongated distribution which actually goes into the 1D threat limit. Now, I've had here for you prepared what we're doing now, single particle nanorod measurements. Um, I, I will just flash these two movies and then jump to the end because my chairman is standing, so I understand that I've finished and exhausted my time. But you see here the donor, and then the uh, emission of the acceptor uh, is now the dye bleaches out, so the donor jumped. So this is a case where we have just one dye molecule linked. This is a case where you see two levels, and now the second dye is also bleached out. So here we can get actually two distances and so on. So we can really analyze this to actually get distributions of uh, different uh, dye molecule numbers on different particles. I'll skip all this, sorry, to the, directly to the end. These are the, dimension, uh, the, these are the uh, distributions of distances that we extract from this kind of single particle analysis, either for spherical particles, short rod or long rod, the spherical particle shows uh, quite a tight distribution because it has only basically a single distance. This is a simulation of the sites, of the, of the uh, available sites in a spherical particle. When you go longer, as you go to very long particles, it flattens out. So um, I'd like to really thank my coworkers here. I've mentioned some of them along the talk, also funding by the ERC of these recent works. And uh, again, wish uh, Mazal Tov to the founders of the field. And still, we're, we're at the top of something, but there's still many, many uncharted islands to look at for the future. And I see here the young members of the audience. So there are very interesting problems to look at based on starting from quantum dots. Thank you very much. <laughs>